There we go. I think I have. There we go. We have been talking about. Sorry, <laughs> getting everything set up. We have been talking about inheritance. So we know that we have DNA um, in sexually reproducing organisms. We are diploid, so we have two versions of every gene. And we've talked about as far as um, dominant recessive genes, like which genes are expressed in traits. So what we're going to be talking about in this week's lecture, um, and we'll probably continue talking about it through next week, is that process more specifically. So when we talk about how a gene gets expressed, what are we talking about, right? Like how does that process occur? So we're talking about transcription and translation, which again um, is one of my very favorite things. I love talking about this. And then after we get done with that, we'll talk about cellular restoration, which is also, I think is, is cool. All right. So, Let's go ahead and get started, and I'll reserve a little bit of time at the end of this lecture um, to talk about whatever you want to do, talk about the exam, or whatever the case may be. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right. Okay, so here. Let me just get everything set up the way I like it. So I have chat activated. So at any time, if you want to um, write me a message or ask a question, please ask it in the chat and I will be sure to address it. Um, also for today, I am going to try another thing. So it's not necessarily gonna be worth points. But um, we had clickers in class to help answer questions. And then since I in, am including the clicker questions in this lecture, because I want you to get exposure to the type of questions that you would probably see on our unit three exam, I still have the clicker questions embedded in this. But what I thought might be nice is instead of having you answer them in the chat, we're gonna try and answer them um, via like an anonymous poll. So sort of like the clickers would be. So we'll try that we'll see if it works. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So like I mentioned, we are going to be discussing um, more genetics. I love genetics, um, but this is the genetics that I really, really love. So let's talk about it. This is in chapters nine through 13, 18, kind of a summary of those chapters, etc. All right, so what are we going to be talking about in these lectures? We are going to be talking about the structure of DNA and RNA. So we already talked a little bit about how we use DNA um, in that we talked about the fact that RNA is the genetic information and we have to replicate it when we go through mitosis or meiosis. So we talked a little bit about replication. Today we're going to be talking about transcription, so we'll be revisiting, and this is where we're really going to elaborate on the structure of DNA. So a lot of stuff will make a lot more sense, especially when we talked about replication and we talked about DNA strand directionality, so three to five, five to three, that's all going to make sense now. And then we're going to talk about how we use DNA and turn it into protein. So again, We've talked about how we go from gene to trait, basically like dominant recessive alleles, like which one's gonna be expressed. And in this lecture, we're gonna be talking about that expression. So we know which gene gets expressed, right? Dominant versus recessive, but we don't know how are the process of that expression. So that's what we're talking about today. We're gonna to be talking about how we go from DNA to trait, which is typically in the form of protein. All right. So our goal, as I keep mentioning, is to talk about how we turn DNA into um, traits. The majority of the traits in, that we're gonna be talking about have to do with some sort of protein expression. So we are gonna be focusing in on how we turn genes into protein. 
Um, as I'll talk about a little bit later, that's not the only thing that we create through uh, transcription and translation. We can also make other structures like RNA, and obviously we also have to synthesize lipids, but we're not going into that. We're gonna be talking about um, kind of one of the core mechanisms for creating structures in the body, which is creating proteins. So to kind of give you some reference for <laughs> all of the names for this process that I will probably be using and that you will hear, um, this process of turning DNA into protein requires two steps. So first we turn DNA, we kind of like copy the DNA into a message in the nucleus of eukaryotic organisms. And then we send that message out of the nucleus and then we turn that into a protein. So that's two steps. So like translate that message and then use that message to create the protein. So we go from DNA, the message is in the form of RNA and then the product is protein. So this collectively is referred to as protein synthesis. So reminder that synthesis means to create. So protein synthesis technically means the creation of proteins. This occurs in two steps, transcription, which is turning DNA into RNA, and translation, which is turning that RNA into protein. This is also referred to as the central dogma. Um, so this process, DNA to RNA to protein, is called central dogma. Anytime you hear the term dogma, that term is typically associated with sort of like more of a religious kind of connotation. Um, because what we think of when we think of the word dogma is just like as close to truth as it can get. Um, this is basically the only dogma that we have in science and um, because the most, almost everything else is a theory. And theories are probably one of the most powerful things that you can get in science because a theory is something that has been tested repeatedly and hypotheses continuously support that scientific fact. And so a theory is like the most solid piece of scientific evidence you can get. So this is a step above that. And DNA to RNA to protein is a called the central dogma because we know that every living organism, so that's the key word, although I should probably say every living and non-living organisms because viruses also follow these rules pretty much. Um, but every living organism for sure follows this rule. Every living organism has a genetic basis of DNA and then has to transcribe that into RNA. And then the RNA is turned into protein. So every living organism, it doesn't matter. Bacteria do this, humans do this, like everything in between does this. Even viruses, which are a non-living thing, are somehow kind of um, involved in this process, although they may jumble those steps. They still kind of follow these processes, mainly because their host cells, our cells, follow this process. So they have to use our cells to make their proteins, so they're kind of restricted to this. But this is called central dogma because all living organisms are DNA-based and all living organisms in order to create the structures of the body, in order to express their genes, go through transcription and translation. So the steps we're gonna be talking about today um, are steps that are translatable to any living organism. Um, and also, I will mention that several viruses do also follow these steps. So everything that we know about transcription and translation in eukaryotic organisms actually has its basis in virology research. So a lot of this stuff, the details of it, we found through research of a virus called simian virus 40. So um, just to tell you how like pan organismal this process is. So all right, so let's talk about it. Obviously I get really excited about it. It's good. <laughs> 
All right. So again, we're discussing central dogma. We have already talked about the terms genotype and phenotype. So what we are doing today is, and next week, is we are going to talk about how we go from a genotype, the genes in our DNA, to the expression of that, those genes, our phenotypes, so the traits. So again, this occurs in two steps, and you can see on this slide, and in order to go from a genotype to a phenotype, we have to go through two steps. The first one is taking DNA and turning it into a message in the form of RNA and then taking the RNA and turning it into the physical manifestation of those genes, which would typically be in the form of protein, um, which is the process of translation. So we're gonna talk about those steps and then we'll elaborate on it. We're gonna talk about this a lot. All right, before we do that, let's try this polling feature, shall we? All right, so this is our first clicker question. Um, so what I'm going to do is just read the question, then I'm going to open the poll, and then hopefully it works. <laughs> okay, so the question is, congenital lactose intolerance is a heritable form of lactose intolerance, and in this case, the individual with the inability to um, catabolize or break down lactose is unable to do so because they have a mutation preventing them from creating the enzyme lactase. Comparatively, non-congenital forms of lactose intolerance typically involve reduced production of lactose, or lactase, sorry, the enzyme, rather than a complete deficiency. So what this means is that if you inherit lactose intolerance, you cannot break down lactose. Whereas if you develop it later in life, typically you're just not as able to break it down. It's not efficient, but you can still do it. So if a person were to be born with congenital lactose intolerance, the defect would be a part of their what? And if a person were to develop non-congenital lactose intolerance, this would be a part of their what? So again, just with this lactose intolerance, if it's congenital, they don't make the protein. If it's developed later, they make the protein, but it's just not as efficient. All right, so what we're gonna do, poll. I'm gonna start this and I'll give you a minute and 30 seconds to answer. So hopefully everybody sees this. Oh, it's working. Yay, okay. Cool, cool. So these are anonymous, FYI, so just like clickers. So I'm seeing a lot of answers. Okay, I believe you can change your answer if you want to. All right, so I'm gonna close it down. Thank you for all of you who have answered. Okay, let's end. So we have a pretty big range of answers here. Let's see what the answer is, shall we? The answer is A, right? So the reason the answer is A is, let's see if I can end that. Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. I like the polling thing, yay. Hopefully that doesn't go away. Okay, so the reason, can we see what everybody answered? Um, I don't know, I don't know if you can see that, but Let's see if I can share. If I'm sharing my screen, you can't, can you see the poll? I'm guessing you can't see that if you're asking. Basically, the answers are across the board. So 25% of you answered A, 25% <laughs> answered B, 25% answered C, 25% answered D. So it's pretty much spread across the board. And that's okay. That's why this is a question that we need to discuss. So I'm happy. So the answer in this case is A. The reason the answer is A is because we are talking about, um, right, so like if a person was born without the enzyme, without the ability to break that down, that would mean that they had a genetic defect. So a defect in their genotype, in their actual genes, 
So they can't create the protein. However, if a person developed it later, and so here we have its reduced production of lactose rather than a complete deficiency, that means that phenotypically, their phenotype, the expression of that enzyme is reduced, right? So the answer here is A. The, um, again, because if you have a congenital defect, that's a def defect in your genes. And then if you have a defect kind of after the protein has been made, that would be a defect in the phenotype. Does that make sense? Feel good? Hope so. I like that polling thing. All right. So feel good with genotype and phenotype. I think we've kind of hammered that in. Um, if you have questions, though, at any time, answer through chat. All right. Okay. Oh, I have a question. The question is, if the expression of the phenotype to produce less lactose, lactase, if the expression of the phenotype to produce less lactase is there, wouldn't that be a genotypic cause? So um, that's an excellent question. So the question is basically saying like, if you don't produce the enzyme, that would be a genotypic cause. But if you have less of the enzyme, would that also be genotypic? And the answer is not necessarily, right? Your gene, if you're producing, even though you're producing less, the gene is still producing it. So the genotype is still intact. So we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there are impacts on gene expression that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a defect um, in their genotype. And that's actually the case with, with this. So we'll talk about that later. That's an excellent question. Good, good job. All right. Okay, so let's move on. Um, in order to understand what we're gonna talk about subsequently, we really need to have a good grounding on the structure of DNA and RNA. So that's what we're gonna talk about now. We're gonna talk about nucleotide structure. Okay, so. The, we have two primary um, nucleotides that we're going to be talking about, and those are DNA, or nucleic acids, I should say, and those are DNA and RNA. So across the board, regardless, DNA and RNA have a lot of similarities. So first off, they both have a base sugar. Um, they both have, coming off that sugar, a phosphate group, and they both have a, what's called a base, and this is a nitrogen-containing compound. And actually what differentiates these nucleotides is going to be that nitrogen-containing compound. So I saw that question, let me answer that in a minute. Okay, so. Let's look at the difference between DNA and RNA first. So when we have DNA, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. So we'll write that. Which is shown over here. And move this over here. Ah, this is what I want to move. Right. So over here, we have deoxyribonucleic acid. I know that this is deoxyribonucleic acid because the one thing that gives it away is the sugar, which you can see here. The sugar for DNA is deoxyribose. All right. As opposed to ribonucleic acid, which is shown on the right, and the sugar is ribose. So very similar, just slightly structurally different. You can see that a major difference is just sort of down here, the position of these oxygens, um, et cetera. I'm not going to go too much into the chemical differences. We don't need to know it, but what you do need to know is that DNA has a just a structurally different sugar, deoxyribose as opposed to RNA, which has ribose as its sugar. So that's a big difference between um, DNA and RNA is the sugar. However, off of the sugar, both DNA and RNA, DNA has a phosphate group, 
RNA has a phosphate group. And coming off that sugar, both DNA and RNA have a nitrogenous base. So you can see a lot of nitrogens on that base. Um, both DNA and RNA share three different bases that they can use. So both DNA and RNA can have a nitrogenous base attached to them called adenine. Both DNA and RNA can have a nitrogenous base attached to them called guanine. Our, and then both DNA and RNA can have a nitrogenous base um, attached to them called cytosine. However, DNA and RNA differ in that in DNA, we can have a base called thymine. So I'll do this. And then in RNA, we can have a base called uracil. I don't know where that went. All right. So again, if we're looking at DNA, we would see four bases. If we're looking at a strand of DNA, we would see adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Those would be the four bases we would see in a strand of DNA. If we're looking at RNA, we would see adenine, guanine, and cytosine, but we would not see thymine. We would instead see a molecule called uracil. So I had a question. What effects come from RNA replacing thymine with uracil when replicating DNA? That's an awesome question. Um, so the question is, so we're going to talk about transcription and translation, which we're going to be talking about converting DNA to RNA. So um, if you remember with replication, what happens is we go from DNA to more DNA. But in order to do that, what we have to do is make little primers, right? So we make, we have a strand of DNA, we add a primer, and that primer is a start site to replicate the strand of DNA. But if you remember, right, that primer is made of RNA. So the question is, what, come, what effects come from RNA replacing thymine with uracil? If you remember with replication, you actually have two DNA polymerases. So the first one basically binds to that primer and binds to the strand and then copies the strand of DNA. The second DNA polymerase actually replaces those RNA primers with DNA. In order to do that, what it does is literally what you asked, is it replaces uracil with thymine. So the, I guess what I'll say with that is that there are no effects of uracil during replication because you have a DNA polymerase, which is specifically um, its main purpose is to replace all the uracil with thymine to basically convert those RNA primers into DNA. Excellent, excellent, excellent question. Good job. So we'll talk more about that when we talk about transcription as well, which is kind of how we're going into. Okay. So again, we have DNA and RNA. These are very similar in that they are both composed of a sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. With, with DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid, the sugar is deoxyribose. With RNA or ribonucleic acid, the sugar is ribose. And with DNA, <clears throat> you can have adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And with RNA, you can have adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine. So RNA doesn't have thymine, DNA doesn't have uracil. All right. So um, we do, hopefully I have this somewhere, yes. Okay, good. So um, we actually, so like I mentioned, we have these bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. We do actually characterize those bases um, based on their chemical structure. So, I'll write this. When we look at the bases that we have possible, there are two categories of bases that we have. And these have really big implications for um, complementary base pairing. 
So for example, you might know, and because um, we've kind of talked about it with replication, or you might know from previous science classes. If you don't, we're gonna talk about it, so don't worry. But um, when it comes to kind of like replicating DNA or transcribing RNA or sort of DNA being double-stranded and having pairs, um, bases actually pair with each other. But the type of bases that can pair are determined by their chemical structure. So if you see here, we have two categories of bases. We have what are called purines and we have pyrimidines. And the reason that matters is because when it comes to base pairing, pyrimidines bind with purines. So we don't have purines binding, we only have purines binding with pyrimidines. So what we have, when we have these binding of nucleotides, um, thymine, which is a pyrimidine, binds to adenine, which is a purine. I should also say that that is in DNA. If we have RNA, I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll just write a new one. Okay, how do I get this? Okay. Um, we have thymine, oh, and I'll just say RNA, uracil, <coughs> sorry, also binds with adenine, which is a purine. So basically, in RNA, uracil just completely replaces thymine. It's just a substitute for it, but they function functionally, they're similar. And then in both DNA and RNA, we have cytosine, which is a pyrimidine, pair with guanine, which is a uh, purine. Okay, so that means that with base pairing, a always pairs with T in DNA, or A always pairs with U in RNA, and then C always pairs with G in both DNA and RNA. So we'll look at this in a minute, um, but the reason that matters is because, again, um, they are characterized into these different groups, and these different groups bind with each other. So thymine and cytosine are our pyrimidines. You can, what just happened? <laughs> You can see on their chemical structure that they um, kind of what groups them is the fact that both thymine and uracil and cytosine have just one um, ring structure. And then if you look at the purines, adenine and guanine, they have two rings. So it is a, chem a structural difference and this is what kind of allows them to bind. So again, we'll get into complementary base pairing here in a minute, but it's important to remember that purines bind with pyrimidines. So thymine and uracil to adenine, cytosine to guanine. So we'll look at that here in a minute. All right, but first let's do another question. Okay. So um, this question, all are part of a nucleotide except for, let's go to clicker question. Let me see. How do I get to a new clicker question? Oh, whoops. Okay. This has one, two, three, four. So let's say, sorry, this poll has all 10 clicker questions. So don't worry about one. You already answered one. Um, but what I would like you to do is for this clicker question, answer number two on the poll. Does everybody see that? I'm not seeing any answers on there. It won't let you submit, oh, without answering all of them. Okay, so, <laughs> well, now we're learning it. Okay, well, we'll work on polling next time. All right, that's okay, we're learning. I do like it. Okay, so, good to know. All right, so. All are part of a nucleotide except, let's look at the answer. All right, so a pentose sugar, which means a five ring sugar, a nitrogenous base, a phosphate group, a fatty acid tail, 
right? Um, or all of the above. So what do you think? Go ahead and type it in the chat box. Good job. Yeah, I see a bunch of Ds and that's great because that is the correct answer. So there is no fatty acid tail on nucleotides. They do have a pentose sugar in DNA, it's deoxyribose, in RNA, it's ribose. They do have the nitrogenous base, adenine, uh, thymine, or uracil, cytosine, and guanine. They have that phosphate group, and so, but they don't have a fatty acid tail. Good job. All right, sorry about the polling. We'll figure that out for next time. Okay, so let's move on. So um, we actually care about those nitrogenous bases quite a bit um, because of the base pairing, but also because when we talk about DNA sequences, it is the sequence of those nucleotides that's sort of like, whenever you hear like genetic code or something like that, what you're talking about is the sequence of those nucleotides. So for example, we might say that a sequence of DNA, we would describe it as ATCGT. Um, that's how we would describe this sequence of DNA on this slide. And we're just describing it um, again in terms of the nucleotide sequence. So I'm describing this in the sequence reading obviously left to right, which is sort of how, how we read um, text in at least English text. So whenever we talked about strand directionality, when we were talking about replication, we talked three to five or five to three. We talk about um, DNA sequences. Um, we almost, we have to reference sort of the strand directionality. So three to five or five to three. And we'll talk about that. For the most part, we're gonna be referencing three to five. And I'll talk about why here in a minute. Okay, so as I mentioned, those nucleotides do form complementary base pairs. This, um, those complementary base pairs are, as you can see from this picture, the basis of how we form double-stranded DNA, but it is also the basis for how we use a strand of DNA as a template to build either a new strand of DNA or a strand of RNA. So everything, the genetic code, is reliant on the pairing of those base pairs. So again, um, if you have an adenine, its pair will be in DNA thymine or an RNA uracil. If you have a guanine, its pair will always be cytosine. There's no other option. And then vice versa as well. So for example, if you have a strand of DNA, you can see on the bottom here, and I, I'm trying to reference that uh, model you see, or the picture you see on the right. If you have a strand of DNA that's like C, C, G, G, A, T, G, T, T, C, G, C, T, T, A, its complementary strand would be based on the complementary base pairs. So the C would mean that the complementary strand has a G, C, G, G, C, G, C, A, T, T, A, um, G, C, so on and so forth. So that's how we can get those strands. One thing that's very important that I wanna mention, um, something that I think is really cool about how these base pairs are formed is that they are actually connected um, or they pair with each other by hydrogen bonds. So if you remember from a long time ago, when we talked a little bit mostly out of class about chemistry. Um, and you, you learned hopefully three different types of bonds, uh, covalent bonds, ionic bonds, and then hopefully you remember talking about hydrogen bonds. When it comes to bond strength, there are two things that matter. Covalent bonds across the board are the strongest bonds that can be formed. Ionic bonds are weaker but still relatively strong because they have that positive and negatives attract. Hydrogen bonds are basically like electrostatic, so like static electricity. So if you think about like rubbing a balloon on your head and how it has that attraction to your head, 
that's about the strength of a hydrogen bond. That is the type of bond that is holding our DNA together. It's important that it's not that strong, but it is important that, you know, when it comes to that, a lot of those bonds between two strands of DNA, they may be weak, but they also form very easily. So they can break and form very easily. But as with anything, there is strength in numbers. So when it comes to the quantity of bonds, if you have more chemical bonds, the stronger that pair will be. And the stronger that pairing will be, the more difficult it is to break, right? So if you look at DNA, what you'll notice is that the pairing between A and T or U happens and is formed with two hydrogen bonds. So A and T would kind of be like this. Whereas the pairing between G and C is three hydrogen bonds. So what this kind of in effect means is that the bond between G and C is just a little bit stronger than the bond between A and T. So the reason this matters, and the reason I think this is so cool, is because um, we ha have to think about what would break a bond. So obviously structure of DNA and structure of nucleotides in these base pairs are really important. So whenever we think about like genetic mutation, you might think of things causing genetic mutations like um, UV light or something like that. But other things that can cause genetic mutations are basically anything that would cause those hydrogen bonds or be able to access those hydrogen bonds and cause them to break. So this can also be anything that can denature, which denaturation is technically breaking those bonds. So this could be like high heat or a high or low pH or anything like that. So we, there are organisms that exist. So mostly bacteria and archaea, although there are some um, maybe like protozoans, but mostly bacteria and archaea that can survive in really crazy environments. And these organisms are called extremophiles, which is like my favorite thing in the world <laughs> because they're extreme. Um, the opposite of me, I am not extreme, <laughs> but, um, or maybe I am depending on what you consider extreme. But extremophiles are called extremophiles because they can live in extreme environments. And one of the things that allows them to live in extreme environments is modifications to their structure that allow them to resist denaturation or genetic mutation or anything like that um, based on what's present in that extreme environment. So for example, an organism that would live in like the sulfur springs in Yellowstone, which has an extremely low pH, very, very acidic, and it's also extremely hot. That organism would have to be able to withstand that extreme heat and extremely low pH. One of the ways that these organisms do that is that if you were to look at their genetic makeup, they may have, and this is not across the board, but one possibility is that they may have um, what's called a higher GC content. So I'll write this on here or GC percentage, right? Um, and what that higher, I don't know where to put this. What that um, higher GC content would allow them to do is basically just have like hardier, DNA or hardier nucleic acid be because of the fact that those bonds, those nucleotide base pairs, have more bonds. So it's just a stronger connection. So they can resist more um, kind of environmental stress, such as heat or pH or whatever the case may be. So something that if you were to go into like environmental biology and do genetic sampling, um, 
environmental DNA sampling, one of the first things people will look at is GC content. So this can tell you a lot about an organism, but one of the things it can do is kind of like suggest um, possibly its environment. Again, that's not across the board. So not all organisms with a higher GC content have are extremophiles. This is just one mechanism that allows them to survive those environments. So remember that. Remember what a GC content allows and why. Okay, so let's move on. All right, so this is where we kind of get to the good stuff and the stuff that we talked about a while ago um, when we talked about replication. When we talked about replication, we talked about the fact that DNA has directionality. So these strands um, do have sort of like a top and a bottom. And we mentioned that those are referred to as like five prime and three prime. So we had some good questions like, what does that mean? <laughs> and I said, just wait. Well, it's finally time. So um, as you can see on this picture, I have boxed in green the five prime and three prime end. And what I wanted to just talk about briefly is what that means. So what I want you to do is focus first on the strand that's shown in red. But I do want to mention that this picture is showing DNA. Um, that's why you have the red strand and the blue strand. Remember, DNA is double stranded. Those strands are anti-parallel. So you can see that the red strand is five to three and the blue strand is three to five. RNA also has directionality. Um, nearly across the board, RNA will always be in the five to three prime direction. So this is talking about genomic structure. For DNA, I think I have this on the other slide, but just in case, um, RNA is always five to three. Let me just double check. Okay, good. I do have that on the other slide, but I'll just put that here. But on this slide, we're focusing on um, the genomic structure of DNA. So just a reminder, the DNA has a structure of a uh, pentose, meaning a five-sided uh, shape, right? <laughs> Let me think about geometry. Um, my daughter's four, so even though we're homeschooling, it's like, what starts with letter A? <laughs> It's not like this is a pentagon. All right, so um, the, in DNA, the sugar, the pentose sugar is deoxyribose. We have that phosphate coming off. You can see the P. And then off the other side, we have the nitrogenous base. So just a reminder that in DNA, we have four possible bases, A, T, C, and G. So what I want you to notice is that in the red highlighted strand, the sugars are upright. And whenever we say that the sugar is upright, the way you can orient yourself to that is that the oxygen on the peak of that sugar is pointing up, right? So you can see the oxygen pointing up. When the sugar is in this orientation in DNA, you'll notice that the phosphate group, which is coming off the fifth carbon, so um, if you like counting carbons, how I will tell you that this is a fifth carbon, you start from the right of the oxygen. So you have the oxygen here. This would be carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and this dent in the line is actually carbon five. And so the phosphate is coming off the fifth carbon in that pentose sugar. And for that reason, we say that the phosphate is on the five, the fifth carbon, what we would call the five prime um, position. So notice when the sugar is upright and the oxygen is pointing upright, our phosphate is pointing upright. And so when it's in that orientation, if the phosphate is upright, that's the five, the fifth carbon that's upright. So we would say that's the five prime end. So now if you look at the bottom of that strand, um, you can see that how these sugars are attached to each other to form the backbone of the DNA. 
So the backbone of the DNA would be considered those sugar phosphate backbones. The nucleotide kind of pops off. So the backbone is the sugar phosphate groups. And you can see these sugars pair together and you see the phosphate is actually what links. So again, the five prime end is when the phosphate is pointing up and it's not linked to a sugar above it, basically. So this would be the five prime phosphate, which is why we call this the five prime end. If you look at the bottom of this DNA strand, you can see the last sugar in this strand because it's not bound to a sugar below it. Um, we have what's called a hydroxyl group, which is uh, a oxygen and a hydrogen. And we have that coming off the one, two, third carbon. And since it's coming off the third carbon, it's in the three prime position. And since that hydroxyl group is pointing down, we say that that end of the DNA, the end where the hydroxyl group is pointing down, would be the three prime end. So this is what gives our DNA strands direction out, our, our new, sorry, our strands of nucleic acid across the board directionality. The phosphate pointing up off the fifth carbon would be the five prime direction. And then wherever the hydroxyl group is pointing down would be the three prime um, end. So looking at DNA, we have, again, it's double stranded. So we have a strand like this and then it's anti-parallel. So we have a strand like this. So this picture shows that very, very well. You can see in the red box, we have a five to three prime strand of DNA where um, the sugars are kind of upright. And then you see our anti-parallel strand, which is three to five. So that's where we get that five to three, three to five directionality, that anti-parallel directionality. And you can see that those are linked by those uh, nitrogenous bases and hydrogen bonds. So I had a question. Why does the red strand orientation make it easier for polymerase to add nucleotides? That's a really good question. And I honestly don't know if I have an answer to that <laughs> aside from um, just evolutionarily, polymerases, uh, at least DNA polymerase um, reads, actually DNA polymerase reads three to five. So it's not necessarily, I think that that's an important part, right? So if you remember DNA polymerase reads three to five to create five to three, RNA polymerase does the same thing. Um, a lot of polymerases are restricted in that directionality and that they pretty much read strands that are in a three to five prime direction. So basically the blue strand, and then they turn it into a five to three prime strand. Why is that easier? It has to do with the fact that um, if you look at that blue strand, you have that hydroxyl coming off. Whenever you add more nucleotides, that hydroxyl is just a really accessible place to kind of create that phosphate hydroxyl bond to add more to nucleotides. Um, and that's just sort of something that's developed evolutionarily over time. Um, but that hydroxyl group is what we use to add nucleotides. Uh, and the phosphate group is used in that similar way. But yeah, that's just sort of something that's developed over time evolutionarily. Like why, I don't know if it's necessarily like a preference, um, but it is a requirement of those polymerases. And yeah, I think it just has to do with how, where they bind those nucleotides. But why that happened over time, I don't know. So. Oh, weird stuff, man. <laughs> Good question, though. Okay, so I hope everybody feels comfortable. Sorry, my allergies are still going crazy. And we fried tofu last night, and so my entire apartment smells like grease, and so I lit a candle, and now my allergies are worse. So uh, anyway, so okay. Um, so I hope everybody understands that strand directionality now, because that is, we already talked about why that's really important for replication, because remember that with replication, DNA polymerase is restricted to read in a certain direction, right? So remember that DNA polymerase can only read 
a three to five prime strand to create a five to three prime stand. As we'll talk about, RNA polymerase does a similar thing. But with DNA polymerase and replication, the reason this matters is because that is where we get the leading and lagging strand and why we have to have the Okazaki fragments and stuff like that. Um, but when it comes to strand directionality, this is what we're talking about. The five prime end, or five to three and three to five, just has to do with the orientation of those sugars. Oh, sorry. Okay, so let's move on. So I do want to just look again um, at RNA just so we can kind of compare the two. Remember that the genomic structure of RNA is very similar to DNA, it's just not double-stranded. Um, it does have a deox, or it does have a ribo, <laughs> it has a pentose sugar. It is ribose instead of deoxyribose. Um, it has four possible bases, two pyrimidines, two purines. The big difference between DNA and RNA is that RNA does not have thymine, but instead it has uracil. Um, a huge difference between DNA and RNA is that RNA is single-stranded. So you can see here that those nitrogenous bases, um, we have the backbone, which is the sugar phosphate, but off, coming off that RNA, those nitrogenous bases are not paired with another strand of RNA. Um, RNA is pretty much across the board. And I'm, I have here typically five to three to kind of like make myself feel comfortable, I think, but I cannot think of any um, RNA strands that are not in the five to three prime direction. My husband's in the other room, so who knows, he might be like correcting me silently in there. So I'll update you if there is a strand of RNA that is not five to three, but to my knowledge, RNA is almost consistently in the five to three prime direction. We'll talk about why um, later, but when it comes to RNA, it is across the board in the five to three prime direction. RNA is in the five to three prime direction. I'm emphasizing that because out of this lecture, that is something that you absolutely need to remember, okay? So RNA is in the five to three prime direction. Again, just for the sake of clarity, I'm gonna like cross out typically because RNA is, I would say consistently, just in the five to three prime direction. Okay, so there are a bunch of different types of RNA um, and we're pretty much gonna talk about all of them throughout this genetics lecture. They're very amazing. I'm sure that everybody, for the most part, has heard about um, two of these. Um, we have talked about the other one before. We will elaborate on these in this lecture. Um, we have three primary types of RNA. First, we have messenger RNA or mRNA, which is that message that is created in transcription. So a central dogma or gene expression or protein synthesis, which are all the same thing. We go DNA to RNA to protein. That RNA that's created in that transition or that process is called mRNA or messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is always in the five to three prime direction. Very important. Um, for translation, where we turn that mRNA into protein, we use another type of RNA, and this is called transfer RNA or tRNA, which we'll talk about later. And then we, when we talked about cell biology, we talked about um, ribosomes. And if you remember, and it's okay if you don't, you'll want to for the final though, but um, if you remember, ribosomes are present in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. The reason I emphasize that is because if you remember, a big difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is that prokaryotes um, do not have membrane-bound organelles, whereas eukaryotes have membrane-bound organelles. 
And if you remember, ribosomes, which are an organelle, we emphasize the fact that they are not membrane-bound organelles. And another, a reason I really want to emphasize that here is because um, ribosomes are not membrane-bound. They are present in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms because they're like one of the most important organelles. The reason that is, is because they basically um, allow the process of translation, which turning mRNA into protein, that they are the organelles that allow that process to take place. Um, they are made out of RNA. So the RNA that makes up ribosomes, the structure of ribosomes, is called ribosomal RNA or rRNA. And does anybody, I'll type it in the chat box if you remember, does anybody remember where rRNA is created? That's a good question. So I'll type that question in the chat box. Think back to, yeah, good job, Samantha. Yeah, the nucleolus. Yeah, the nucleolus. So if you remember in eukaryotic organisms, you have the nucleus, and in the nucleus, you have your DNA, but then you have that nucleolus. The purpose of the nucleolus is that's where the ribosomal RNA, that's where ribosomes are made. That's where our RNA is synthesized. Good job. All right. So, um, just a little throwback there. So those are the two primary, are the three primary types of RNA that we're gonna be talking about in this lecture. Um, but we, there are some others that exist that we'll also discuss as well. But again, across the board, RNA, single-stranded, uracil, not thymine, ribose, not deoxyribose, but extremely important, <laughs> it is in the five to three prime direction. So I had a question. Since RNA is single-stranded, is it more vulnerable to mutation or destruction due to environmental exposure? This is an excellent question, right? Because we just talked about the fact that we have the hydrogen bonds and that bonding protects those bases. This is a really interesting question because historically, uh, it was believed that RNA, because it wasn't double-stranded, because those bases were exposed, um, it was believed that RNA was like really weak and degraded really easily. And another thing that kind of like supported that is that in a cell, you have a bunch of enzymes. These are called RNAases, and they're basically enzymes that degrade RNA. So what would happen is if you did this experiment where you ran out like DNA or RNA on a gel or whatever, you get this like big band, like at the bottom and historically that was believed to be like junk and it was believed because like RNA was you know so structurally like weak that it was like breaking apart and then just like wouldn't even run on in the experiment. We know now like I will tell you <laughs> I used to have to work with RNA and in order to work with RNA like people were so paranoid because they were so worried it was so weak like we would have to wear special gloves and we would have to like use special water and we would have to use like special equipment, all of this stuff because you had to make sure that those enzymes that were called RNases that degraded RNA, um, like that it was, those were not present. And I am not telling, like working with RNA, like you would think that somebody was working with Ebola. Like people were just like, ah, oh, so scared. But now we know that RNA is actually like really hardy. So to answer the question, like structurally, it would lead us to believe, and historically it was believed, that RNA was less stable, you know, because of its structure. But we know now that it is actually like extremely hardy and extremely stable. A lot of RNA can last and has to last, like we'll talk about a little bit yeah, we'll talk about later in this lecture, probably next week. Um, 
some RNA has to last the lifetime of the cell, and it can. Um, so RNA is actually pretty hardy. What makes it hardy? Is, I'm not really sure. So let me look into that. I'm actually going to write that down because I like that question so much. So what stabilizes RNA? Good question. I'll look it up. All right. But no, it's pretty hardy. Um, you do have enzymes that break it down, but you can mitigate it. Good question. All right. So that's our structure of RNA. So remember DNA, double-stranded, five to three, three to five. Um, RNA, single stranded, five to three. <laughs> All right. So let's move forward, shall we? Okay. This is just comparing the two. Again, I do want you to remember the fact that DNA is double stranded and it has um, thymine as well as adenine, guanine, and cytosine, whereas RNA is single stranded and has uracil as well as adenine, guanine, and cytosine. Um, DNA, five to three, three to five. RNA, five to three. Okay. All right. So let me see where we have this. Um, yeah, we can talk a little bit more. So let's get into the good stuff. Now we know the structure. And now we're going to talk about how we take that DNA and turn it into RNA and then turn that into protein. And again, I just love this so much. <laughs> this thing is so cool. Um, but before we get there, let's talk about some details. So I do want to reiterate that this is called a lot of things. Um, this is called protein synthesis because we're creating proteins. This is also called gene expression because we're taking genes and turning it into traits. So expression is the expression of those genes as traits. This is also referred to as central dogma. Those all mean the same thing, which is DNA to RNA to protein. Okay, so just to reiterate what we're looking at and kind of relate it back to what we just got done talking about um, the past couple of weeks, whenever we're talking about protein synthesis, we are talking about the process of taking genes, our genotype, and expressing it which the expression of genes would be um, the creation of a phenotype. So um, that involves two steps, transcription, which is taking DNA and making a copy of it in the form of RNA. And we'll talk about why that's important later. And then taking that copy of RNA and turning it into protein. So we're gonna be talking about those two processes in turn. Before we get there though, I want to give you some important terminology and orient ourselves to how the genome is organized. So as you know, as humans and any other organism, there is a lot of DNA, right? And they have to express a lot of traits, right? So as a human, you know, we have to worry about hair color, eye color, <laughs> but not only that, like a ton of different enzymes, all the enzymes that allow us to, you know, take in sugar and take in oxygen and turn it into uh, ATP, all the steps involved in that, lactase we talked about just allows us to like break down milk sugar. It is our DNA that codes for all of those traits. And so we have a lot of DNA, um, as you can imagine. And I will get into this a little bit later, but um, kind of the singular view of how this takes place is that, and how we're gonna talk about this first before we talk about how this is not the case, <laughs> is that <clears throat> in a strand of DNA, you have organized that DNA into units. And those units, are called genes. So we already talked about the genes and alleles and how basically like every gene codes for a trait. So we, what we're talking about here is a gene, so a segment of DNA that codes for a particular trait. That could be an enzyme, that could be a protein, that could be, you know, whatever it is. But it's a little segment of DNA that codes for something. 
So um, it's important to know where a gene begins and ends. The seg we have a segment of a gene shown in this image. You can see that the beginning of a gene is called the promoter region. And then the end of a gene is called the terminal region. So the promoter is just the beginning of a gene, the start of a gene, and the terminal region is the end of a gene. So whenever we talk about protein synthesis or transcription and translation, what we're doing is we are only synthesizing genes, individual genes, right? So from a promoter to the terminal region, just one gene. I emphasize that because when we talked about replication, right, when we talk about taking a, D a strand of DNA and copying it into another strand of DNA, we talked about how we have replication bubbles and, um, you know, replication forks and all that stuff and how we have to move really fast because we have to replicate the entire genome, right? And we don't want to leave it open because that leaves us open for genetic mutations. Replication, what you're doing is you're copying the entire genome all at once. With transcription, which is taking a gene segment of DNA and making a copy of it in the form of mRNA, which you'll then turn into protein. With transcription, you are only transcribing the segment of DNA. You're only opening up the segment of DNA that is related to a trait you're going to express, right? So it's not the entire gene, or the, it's not the entire strand of DNA. It's not the entire genome being transcribed at once. You only transcribe like one gene at a time based on what you need, basically. So what that means is that for transcription, what you're transcribing is only a gene. So that would be from the promoter region to the terminal region, start to end, that little segment of DNA. So that's what we, why that segment of DNA matters, because transcription just happens piecemeal kind of as it's needed. We also arrange our DNA strand into um, what's called coding. So I'm gonna, let's see, coding. See, I'm going to say this. Transcription leads to traits, um, right? So, and how am I going to phrase that? Yeah, there we go. We'll talk about what that means later. Okay, so we organize our DNA strands, our entire genome, into two different types of DNA. First, we have DNA that has promoter and terminal regions, and when we transcribe that, it is turned into protein, right? So that is what we call an exon. Another term for exon is basically like the fragment of DNA that actually codes for a trait. So this is the segment of DNA. These are the nucleic acids that will be important for creating a protein. We also have segments of DNA um, that are called introns. So we'll talk about how, where these are later. But these introns um, originally, like a long time ago, were called junk DNA. They were believed just to be sort of like spacers and not important. But now we know that introns are extremely important even though they are not transcribed into protein, they have a very important regulatory function. So basically they can help tell genes when they need to be transcribed or how much, et cetera. So we'll get into that later. But the genome is arranged into exons. I'm gonna highlight that. Exons and introns. Exons are the portions of DNA that directly code for protein and introns are the portion of DNA that are not transcribed into protein. All right, so that is where I'm going to end today because what, it's a really good place to stop because when we come back on 
what day is today? Thursday? When we come back on Tuesday, <laughs> we are going to talk about the process. So we've talked a lot about how we're going from genotype to phenotype, how basically in this process we take a gene and then we make it into mRNA and then we make that into protein. We've talked about the fact that if we're going to make protein, those are exons, or it's the exon DNA that we use to do that. Um, and on Tuesday, what we'll be able to jump into is the process. So how we take DNA and turn it into RNA, and then how we take that RNA and turn it into protein. And I just, I love this process. And then after that, we got to talk about how that's regulated and how it varies and some really cool stuff. Um, and then of course, how we can use this to our benefit in biotech. So um, that's where we're gonna leave off today. And we still have a couple minutes. So at this point, feel free to head out or feel free to ask questions. Um, if you need to head out, I will obviously be online and logged into Zoom from 11.30 to 12.30. Um, those are open office hours, so feel free to pop in and I'll be able to, um, yeah, I'll leave it up, no problem. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm here. I hope everybody is faring well. Um, I know it's a difficult time, but, you know, I haven't had to put on real pants in a really long time. So honestly, I am like fully embracing this. I'm wearing pants, but like, <laughs> but like joggers, <laughs> not jeans, which is like so nice. So, right. um, oh yeah, of course, everything, every single lecture I give, I upload to YouTube. So this will, the entire thing will be available on YouTube, what I do after I after I basically stop the Zoom lecture, it it like uploads to my computer, and the first thing I do is upload it to YouTube. So it'll be on there within 30 minutes, I promise. It'll also be on Canvas and Google Drive. Yeah, you betcha. Yeah. All right. If you have questions, I'll leave everything open for another. Um, I'll leave everything open for another until class ends, like in two minutes. But uh, I'm gonna just shut my camera off. But if you have questions, right, leave the chat, leave them in the chat box, no problem. I won't shut down the Zoom room until 10:15. So good to see you guys. Oh, I have a question. Good. Okay. Um, so the question is, regarding an earlier slide, does GC content also determine resistance to the colder climates? Yeah. So again, this is not across the board. So you will find organisms that survive in really cold environments that do not have a higher GC content. So it doesn't always um, perfectly correlate to uh, like ability to survive in extreme environments, but it it, it is. It is a common feature of organisms that do. GC content can give us a lot of clues about an organism. That's just one of them. Um, yeah. Good question. Yeah. And if there are any other questions, well, again, I'm leaving it open for another minute, so don't worry about it. And yeah. Yeah, have a good day, everybody. I miss you. Thanks for coming to lecture today. All right, I'm gonna shut it down. If you have questions, 11.30 to 12.30. Oh, I had a question. Okay, cool, good. Bit confused about how to calculate the chi-square critical value. Okay, so for the chi-square critical value, what I'm gonna have you do, hold on just a second. I'm also just gonna 